Okay, folks, today we're going to be talking about, uh, mostly about the John King family that, on the island and as it relates to my Uncle Wilde a lot because he was uh, just the entrepreneur extraordinaire on the island during his days here. So we happen to be up here at the museum and right behind me is one of the schoolhouses. There were several schoolhouses around the island and this is one of them. Uh, that was because of bus transportation wasn't very easy when you think way back in the 1800s. So people went to school close to their home. So anyway, uh, this is the museum property and it was King property way back when. After I got along, came along, it was Pittman property. But uh, uh, the King, that side of the King family was still on the island. And uh, so uh, I was going to give you some vital statistics here on Uncle Isle. And on, well, first myself, I was born 87 years ago, come the 20th. Uh, on this island, and my dad was born in May of 08 on this island. And uh, so we've been around here a long time. But we'll go back to uh, Grandpa King came to the island in 1875 when he was 16 years old. Ten years later, he married uh, Marcia Deitman. She was only 16 years old. And so uh, that would have been 1885. So uh, anyway, they uh, they were married in uh, 1885 when Grandma King was 16 years old. In 18 uh, 86, along came my Uncle Lyle, the first of six boys and two girls. But Uncle Lyle was the entrepreneur. He hired everybody. He hired his brothers and he hired his dad. And uh, once he got going in business. <clears throat> but back to uh, the timing, the pig war took place on the island. Of looked it up and it was 1872 that they came to the arbitration to set, settle the, the pig war and that's when the British troops moved off the island. And then uh, the railroad didn't get across the country till 1869. So th these are those years when there weren't any cars, the roads were very rudimentary and uh, so kind of picture this family started out with, with that and they came here because they could homestead property they had come up here from Yam Hill Oregon so Uncle Lyle was born on Lincoln's birthday in 1886 that would have been 21286 he died on March 10th of 1948, that would have made him uh, 62 years old, I believe. And he first was married to Agnes Wright, that was Dr. Wright's uh, daughter. And they were married in June of 07. That was a year before my dad was born. When my dad was born, Uncle Lyle and Aunt, Jeanette, uh, and, uh, Aunt Agnes at that point were having their family too. So my dad was an uncle when he was born. And that makes the history of the King family around here very complicated because everybody says, oh, is that, was that your cousin or was that your brother or uncle? And it's because of these dates that happened so close. There were four children for Uncle Al in that marriage. Would have been Carl, Dorothy, 
Blair, and Mildred. Carl ended up being the one with the slaughterhouse. Dorothy married a gentleman from Riverside, California, and <clears throat> Blair ended up running the, the grocery store. And Mildred married a Sandwith, Pat Sandwith, who already had hundreds of acres on the island as a young man. Then he was married again in 1920, and from that marriage, Jeanette Borchers became Lynette and Kathleen, and they were like seven and five years older than I was. And we were all raised up out on the farm where we'll be able to show you in a, a little while. Okay, well here we are at what I call the home place. I lived here till I was about 13 or 14 years old, from the time I was about one year old. Uh, so this was Uncle Lyle's main property, and this is where Uncle Lyle and Aunt Jeanette lived. And they had the two girls, Kathleen and Lynette. Uh, and that was Uncle Lyle's sort of second family. And uh, I think I kind of almost got adopted as a boy into it. One of the reasons is we lived in the little red house down there. And uh, the, uh, when my two sisters came along in that tiny little house, which had tiny little two bedrooms uh, was a little bit too full for me and so I would come up and I slept in the basement of this house most of those years. So there was always work to be done and it always started early in the morning. We had an old international truck with no muffler on it and uh, Uncle Lyle seemed to start that truck about 4.30, which meant time to get going for the chores. We had to leave the house here and take our bucket down and milk usually one or two uh, cows. We didn't have, during my time, we didn't have a creamery operation here, although I think prior to Uncle Lyle's buying it, uh, we had cattle and, uh, and sold creamery. So uh, we lived down in that little house, and the uh, interesting thing about it, the little red house down there, the interesting thing about it was uh, they had added a bathroom onto uh, a little house, and that was obviously a little built on that didn't have any heating in it or anything like that. It backed right up to the kitchen stove. The kitchen stove provided our cooking, but it also uh, provided the hot water because there were coils, copper coils, in the uh, in the stove. And when they were heated, they heated the water tank, which was located in the bathroom. And in the bathroom, this galvanized tank was there. You could put your hand on it up near the top. It was nice and hot. And down at the bottom, it was as cold as cold could be. Uh, so that's where we got our hot water. And uh, there was no, no refrigeration. The refrigeration was two holes in the wall and a pantry up against that, where we stored anything we wanted to keep cool. And uh, what we would want to keep cool is the milk. We would go down in the morning and milk the cow and bring the bucket of milk home and pour it into pans about this big around, about this deep, and uh, let it set for a few hours and the cream would come to the top and the milk at the bottom. We had a lot more milk than we needed, so that milk would uh, be set out to turn away and then we made our own cottage cheese. Um, when you bought flour, flour always came in a, a cloth bag, and uh, we would put this, I'll call it whey, I'm not sure of the terms, in there, squeeze out all of the moisture we could, and then mom would hang those on the clothesline and uh, 
that's where we got what I call cottage cheese. And the next building between here is the garage is also a wonderful well. And uh, the water was pumped up by a windmill until oh, a few years before I uh, uh, left to go to town. And uh, I just heard the other day the reason that big tree right there is so gnarly is that uh, it would keep getting trimmed off so it didn't grow up too high and interfere with the wind blowing on the windmill. So it, <laughs> it was interesting when I took a look at that tree the other day and saw now this many years later uh, how gnarly it is. Uh, there's a couple of things about these fields that are right behind us here. This one on the left was just one field that, that right now there's a lane through it. And uh, that field was where we would put the ewes in the, during lambing time. So we'd drive all the ewes up there and then we could just look out the front door, front window, and see if there were any of them having trouble. They, uh, it was the ewes had these big wool road and when they'd get down to have their lambs a lot of times uh, they couldn't get back up so we'd have to give them a hand. Uh, there was a, a big effort on not to not to get any pet lambs. Uh, that was kind of hard at first because the ewes refused to get them. Uh, another you would refuse to take the lamb if the mother had died or something like that. I do recall, though, we finally got to a point where we gave them some kind of a shot and uh, it, it kind of took their uh, distinctions away and we could put any lamb on that you that we wanted to. Over in this field that's right behind us, we call the alfalfa field and uh, we just primarily during my time raised hay on this field. There is uh, the airport which Uncle Lyle put in that we've mentioned before. He put this airfield in right after World War II when everybody was going to have a plane in their yard and so uh, we got the road grader out and, and it started down here against that fence line and went out to the road. <clears throat> uh, it happened that uh, my wife, Sonny, was going to have number two son, uh, Michael. And uh, Mike was uh, late. Uh, so Miss Dale was the nurse on the island and Dr. Heath was already over in Bellingham. Uh, Miss Dale came out and checked Sonny and said, you have to fly to Bellingham. It was uh, about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. And uh, so Roy Franklin came out, fired up the plane. We put a couple cars down there so he could see approximately where the airport was. And we took off and went to Bellingham. Uh, false alarm. Uh, I had to sleep on a really uncomfortable little bench and Sonny slept in the hospital bed and the next day we caught the bus and uh, came back. So <laughs> that was the first try at getting Michael here. Uh, let's see what else do we need to talk about up here. Oh the water, back to the water. The water was pumped up by the windmill and then there was a tank over the top of that garage out there and it was an open at the top tank but the water was pumped up there so you'd have water pressure and uh, so that was how we got our water here very good well area uh, as we uh, look down that way the kennel field was is down that way is pretty much parallel to this field and that field this side of kennels down there I was still uh, they had, hadn't been totally cleared 
to the point that I helped work on that clearing of that. And uh, there were great big stumps that we would come up against that we couldn't get out with any of the horses or equipment we had. We would put uh, dynamite under them, and dynamite was very common. We had a little wooden case of dynamite, dynamite about an uh, inch and a half diameter, and about five inch sticks of dynamite. We have a case of those in the back of the truck almost all the time. Of course, nowadays it's just uh, you don't see that dynamite. But I think maybe what we ought to do is move on down to the barn now. Okay, well what we're looking at out here straight ahead is the end of Lampard Road, which comes up out of town by the big water tank. And then as we pan to the left here, these fields were pretty much the way they were uh, when I was living out here. But no barn down there that you see is the main thing in the... The fence went right on down and out to the San Juan Valley Road. My folks owned the kennel, what we call in the kennel airfield of property, the town side of that fence line. <clears throat> and Uncle Lyle owned all the rest of this. And when I was a kid here, my folks still didn't, hadn't bought that, what we call the Schmedley place there. We would, uh, I recall this far corner of this field right here that we're looking at real well in that uh, one day we had this, I think it was Goldie, the name of our uh, riding horse, uh, had a foal out there. He had a big, I think we call that foal lightning because of the big stripe down it. We had these wonderful border collies for driving the sheep. And they'd also drive horses and cattle and stuff. And uh, we had a gate to this barnyard that we're standing in right here. And the horses would be down in this field with uh, big work horses. But then also the pony, the Shetland pony, Rosie. And Rosie was just an ornery little bugger. And the dogs and I would be coming out down in this area, get the horses right up here, ready to come through the gate. And then Rosie would just take off, and of course the big horses would follow her. So that was uh, one of the experiences I had here. If, if down in this corner right over here, we had a lane that went down, and. Uh, showed you previously or you'll see the thrashing machine where well, we put one of those places out in that corner so that the livestock could be under the straw which was up on posts and then uh, a platform made up there so that we had a straw house for the livestock for the winter time. Right over in this field the last say 500 feet of it that way thousand feet down that way. Uncle Lyle had planted some corn. We were not corn growers at all, but he uh, decided to plant that because when we had, when he had guests up from Seattle during the hunting season, the pheasants were always in that corn and it was always pushed off with the dogs. You know, They would be, have driven down to the other end with the pickup truck and be ready to do their hunting as the pheasants uh, flew out. It was amazing that we could go in there every two hours, there would be pheasants there. A lot of pheasants on the island when I was a kid. Uh, over here, I was going to, can we go over this way towards those trees? <coughs> In those trees right over there, we had a truck body all the time. The truck, we only had one really capable truck of hauling the uh, livestock and also hauling the meat to Seattle. So over in there, we would have the 
body that was not on the truck at that time. We had a stock body and a van body hanging on chain falls. And we would back the truck under after butchering on Tuesday night and load the van body to be ready to haul the uh, meat to Seattle on Wednesdays. Tuesday was a really busy day. Uh, there were also in that area over there was the, where we kept the hogs. We raised a lot of eggs because we had the contract with the infirmary for the butter. And the butter was pumped by the creamery into a big tank downtown and uh, we would take this trailer down, four-wheel trailer that was an abandoned truck that we used, just converted into a trailer, and it had about a 2,000 gallon tank on it. We'd fill that up and then bring it out here and have to back it down and put the uh, buttermilk in the troughs for the pigs. We also fed the pigs with crushed uh, oats and barley. We raised most of the oats and barley on the different fields around here, and then we'd take it downtown to McKenzie's to have it milled. And uh, we'd take it down in burlap bags, and then uh, they would grind it and put it back into the burlap bag. So we had a lot of sacks around here for uh, the grain. This area here was for uh, loading the livestock that needed to be taken into town. We had that ramp up there and we had a place to back the truck in, which is pretty much what we still have today. And we had these various pens. I picture this place where we, uh, we shoe the horses, we mark the lambs, we put an earmark on them, and cut off the tails and castrated the, the bucks so that they'd be ready for uh, butchering in August, July or August. We'd, uh, we'd breed the, uh, the ewes, we put the bucks in with the ewes so that we'd have the lambs at uh, Valentine's Day. So that was the time most of them were born and most of them were butchered in July and August. We also marked the pigs here and uh, well, we did have some steers, but most of those were, uh, were already steers when they were brought up here. I have a little bit more about the steers uh, wintering stock over in the, as we go up here to the barn. So this is this is the original barn. Everything is pretty much the way it was in those days, except that they don't have the partitions in that we had. But this first portion, say 12 feet or so in here, was for the stalls for the horses. And uh, they still do have the place where we hung the harnesses up. Uh, we, will it work in the Shadow here. But those those big poles that stick out there were for hanging up the collar and and the uh, harness. And then there were stalls, about four or five stalls for the big old horses that looked like the Clydesdales that you see with Budweiser nowadays. And they were smart, wonderful horses. Then next. To the horses, we had an area where we kept uh, steers in the winter time. Uncle Al would go down to the Boone family in uh, Bothell, of all places. Uh, now I would go down there and see that place where we used to pick up these steers, and it's just nothing but big buildings and uh, businesses. But in those days, it was a farm right close to Bothell. And we would bring a couple of loads, which would probably amount to 30 of those yearlings up, put them in here and feed them hay. And uh, we, had, we bought molasses 
in the big 50-gallon drums and and fed the molasses in there. And this, so. Then next on down was a place where we kept the hides and the pelts from the slaughterhouse. We would bring those uh, cow hides and pelts out and stack them up and sold them with rock salt. And once we got a truckload, we would take those down to Seattle and sell uh, a load of pelts. And as we went on down further, we got to the, the milk cow and uh, the manger and stuff. And that's where we'd come every morning and, and milk the cow every morning and night and uh, walk the milk on at home. So that, that's what we use this barn for down here. There are places in the barn, and I talked to one of their kids and knows about what was going on here. There's still a place here where we filled the wool sacks. The wool was taken off the sheep, wrapped up and tied in a bundle of about this big for each ewe, and then these were dropped into a wool sack, which is about five and a half to six feet deep, and uh, oh, about three three feet in diameter. One of those kids had to be down there to to push these wool down into the side and get it, get it as hard as we could, so we could fill those uh, wool sacks full of uh, wool. When you got out of there, you had that nice feeling that you get from raw wool on your hands and whole body. <clears throat> I know because I was in that wool sack a lot. The, uh, so they used the upstairs for shearing. We also used the upstairs for uh, keeping the hay. The hay was brought in there on wagons. Well, first we cut it and out in the, these fields that we kept for hay out here. And we would go through the hay raking process, the packing up the uh, stacks of, of hay and then load them on the wagon. And so we have a wagon with a team of horses on it and bring them up and the horses would go into the barn upstairs there with the wagon behind and then we had a hay fork that we drove down into there and it had uh, uh, catches on it for the hay. We drive it down, turn those catches, and then uh, haul it up with the horse at the end of the barn. There was a rail that would go up and catch in to this rail and go down over the haystack and then there'd be somebody up there moving the hay back to the edges of the, the building. And he'd yell, trip it, when he was ready to have hay put there. And we would trip it, and the, those forks would open up and drop these. There's usually six to eight forks loads on each uh, wagon. There was also another barn right next here, which is totally gone now. So that one was also filled with hay. I've spent a lot of my life putting that hay up in those barns. And then, when winter comes, getting it back down to the manger. Uh, let's see, what else do we have about it? Oh, um, it's interesting to note that all of this property that Uncle Isle had here of the home place is still owned by Uncle Isle's heirs. So, let's see. From here, uh, we had other interesting things going on. Let's see, we'll, we'll take a look up this way. Right now, it's hard to believe, but there are houses up there. But those were, were all those trees, all the way along from the fence line over there, over to this line. And back in those trees, we dug a silage pit. That was a... Uh, 14 or 15 feet wide and about 40 feet 
into the hillside and maybe eight feet deep at the back when the pea vines were being uh, produced when they were taking the peas down to the pea cantry, Uncle Al bought this silage and we put the silage in those uh, big pits and then come feeding time uh, what we would do is back the old truck in there load that cut that silage with a big cutter thing and load it into the truck and then take it down through the field here and throw it off for the livestock and that, that's what I, where I get that point where I tell people I don't know when I ever learned to drive because it was my job to stand behind the wheel when I couldn't reach anything but the seat and the wheel and head towards that gate over there and they would put it in the slowest gear which was about a slow walking speed and climb up on the back of my dad or Haley or whoever was with and uh, we would uh, drive across I would drive across the gate from there back up there and throw the sign Uh, I guess that about covers this area. We There's lots of stories. We also had a sheep dip area right over there. And uh, what it was, uh, after the shearing, we would put those ewes down through a trough dug into the ground, three feet, and uh, then the sheep would kind of walk and swim to the other end of it in this uh, sheep dip which would kill the uh, kill all the ticks and uh, give them a new lease on life. As soon as they got out of there and got right off a bit we had a sheep painting uh, operation where you have a can of paint and on our sheep we always put a red ring on the butt to mark that those were our sheep. Also, the sheep were marked in the ear. We had a slit and then a cut off to the end of the ear, and that meant those were ours, in case they got out and got mixed up with other people's sheep. So, shall we move on from here? Okay, uh, we've come out here from town, and we're at the corner of Douglas and San Juan Valley Road. It's uh, on this map, it's right here. This is where we're located. Now this first piece of property up to the Lampard Road is the property that my folks owned and sold to Ed Kendall. And as we get around these trees behind us, we'll be able to see that airport that he put in. But we're located right there. Now and most didn't, of didn't this Franklin, uh, if they had Franklin's properties right over here? No. No, Isn't Franklin... Was a lot further out. Okay. Yeah. So right, right over here behind us is a lot of the Sundstrom property, and then the Lyle King property was here and on into town. And the guards there were uh, <clears throat> Roy Guard owned on the other side, owned this area along the valley, this road, and down here. And then we uh, mentioned uh, the sandwiths. The sandwiths were pretty much covered this area and across the road here. And uh, so anyway, uh, we're right here, we're right here, and we're going to talk a little bit about this little piece of brush that's behind me here. Uh, we, we always had a shotgun in the truck, and in, in the, before 1940, there were he pheasants on, on, on the island. In fact, there was a pheasant season like have three cocks and one hen would be the daily limit. <clears throat> so we always uh, carried a gun, and if we saw a pheasant fly into a little brush pile, well, oftentimes we'd stop. So this one day, when Uncle Lyle was there, 
we uh, go driving along here, we see this hen pheasant. Well, we don't know whether it was hen or cock. Fly across the road and get into this brush pile behind me. Now we had a game warden. At that point, hens were no longer alive. At that point, uh, we had a game warden who actually lived on the island. And uh, so it just happened that the game warden came along approximately. He was, he was in the vicinity here. And it was my job to get out with the dog and run this dog through this stack of brush here to get the pheasant up. And then the guys were over here to shoot it. And I got in the middle of the brush pile up there. The dog got the pheasant up. And the pheasant came flying out. And bam! And so I yelled, did you get her? Because at that point, I knew what the gender was. <laughs> yep, <laughs> got her. And so the pheasant ended up pretty much in the in the brush, and, and Uncle Lyle had to fight his way in a few feet to get the pheasant. He, he's walking down this road right here behind me, and he sees that the game warden is walking that way. And they were kind of old friends. Uncle Lyle knew it. Well, everybody knew everybody on the island at that point. But when he saw the game warden, he went and threw that Bird. hand way back over into this terrible rose bushy stuff. And the game warden didn't say a word, but walked right past him. And the game warden found his way in through all of these rose bushes and got the pheasant. And then he uh, took it out and was going to uh, give Uncle Lyle a ticket, which he did. And Uncle Lyle said he wanted a, 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 tri a trial, go to court. So uh, they went to a court, and I think the court might have said that he was guilty, but he wanted to appeal. So uh, they uh, put the pheasant back in the freezer again, and this all took like a year, year and a half. And uh, when the trial was, say, mid-year schedule, both Uncle Lyle passed away, and the game warden passed away on the ferry coming back from work, so they were both gone for the trial, and that was it. So <laughs> every, time, every time I drive by this piece of uh, little brush in the corner, I recognize it very well. <laughs> what happened to the bird in the freezer? <laughs> I don't know. It might oh, still be there. <laughs> Actually, that's another another thing about the islands in those days. If you, I had mentioned before, we canned almost everything. We had to can fish. We had to can the peas. We just for the freezing capacity. Well, then the next thing that happened for families on the island is, I think it was the Grange, took that piece of property right in downtown there and made a. a freezer Ice building pump. and you could go in and you could rent a little five by five or something like that and keep your frozen stuff there which you know most a lot of the people in town did so uh, that was the days of changing over from canning to uh, freezing and that's frozen hand pheasant may be around somewhere i don't know <laughs> Okay, now we're uh, looking at one of the plaques here at the museum, and this is a great depiction of what the uh, process was of harvesting. Usually on the island here was oats or barley. Uh, could have been wheat, could have been dry peas. But here are the shocks of, of bundles of 
grain, and they had to be left out in the field for a certain amount of time until they were ready to be put through the threshing machine to be sure that the grain was dry and ready to uh, thread. Here's, this is a team of horses over here pulling the, the machine over here that cut the grain and, and as in my time we had a machine that also bundled it as it came off that sickle. So, and we, I believe this is right down where South Beach is. This is about where American Camp would be today. And uh, that's the road on out to Cape San Juan. A lot of the fences were built like this with rail rather than uh, the, what you see today, uh, steel fences. And now we, we'll go over here to this. This is a two bottom plow. It means it made two furrows at once. During my time, we were just on the conversion zone of pulling these things by horses. It would be a great big team of horses, like the Clydesdales that uh, Budweiser uses, to give you a picture of the size of the horses, and then Percherons and mixes of different uh, work horses. They made two furrows. And then you go down to the end of the field and go across to the end and go back up the other way. Which always ended up in the field with a dead furrow. There would be a, a spot, there would be low spots in the field. And I became very familiar with those when we were doing our rabbit hunting at night. We'd be going along a nice smooth field and also and all at once you'd get to the dead furrow and boom. Now this is a hay rake. After the sickle went through, we come along with the hay rake. This was how it was pulled by a light team of horses. Very easy job for the horses. The operator sat on that seat there and drove the team, and you had a trip that foot piece right there. When you got to the the line of hay that you made across the field, you hit that trip foot, and that would dump that line, that hay that you had picked up into that line. And it made it a lot easier for the people who came along next with their forks and stacked the hay up into shocks. Again, if we shocked the hay in the field to give it a chance to dry. If wet hay was put in these barns, and during my time probably three barns burned down, if you would have uh, whatever that uh, combustion happened and uh, the, uh, the barns would burn. So these were towed along by the horses, and the horses were very happy and knew what they were, where they were going, and uh, easy days work when you were breaking hay. Okay, now we're uh, looking at the threshing machines. A lot of people have these sitting out in their yards as you're driving up and down from California and so forth, I've noticed, but I su suspect that many people don't really know how it worked. And in this case, over at the far end this direction, you have the conveyor to bring the uh, grain in. We saw the bundles of grain were dried out in the field. They're then loaded on the wagon. All this is done with the fork and human energy. You get it here, these bundles are then tossed, tossed into the conveyor where they're brought in and chopped up to go into the uh, the actual threshing machine. Now all of these pulleys on here are busy either moving the conveyor belt along or in some cases shaking the, the wheat and running it back and forth so that the wheat 
will uh, come away from the straw. And it progresses on back, and you have the seeds of the wheat are, are dropping out. But along with that, you're getting mustard seeds and a whole bunch of things that you don't really want. So those uh, have to be sifted out through a sifter. And then it keeps proceeding back here. And these things allow this part down here to shake, shake, shake. And you finally get the straw it back down into this big fan area here where a big fan is going in there and the straw has blown out that big shaft a big pipe over on the other side there. What we would do at times is make a little shed for the straw to land on top and have that place where the animals would hang out during the, uh, the bad weather in the winter time. Now what we're really looking for is the grain. So the grain came up a conveyor here and got dropped into this shaft and came down into a place where you put on a burlap bag. And these burlap bags would usually hold about, say, 110 pounds of, of uh, wheat. And as, as it was filled, you shifted the, the sorter in there and put the wheat in the, coming down the other side to fill this bag. And that bag was sewn up and thrown on the truck and hauled off to the grain. So um, the other thing about this is it had to be perfectly um, level. So we'd hook up the big old John Deere to it and my dad would dig in the rock pressure machine would be level. We'd then pull it into the, these holes that he had dug for the wheels to uh, level up the whole machine and, if, and put the level on it in eight or ten places and decide if we had to go a little lower or a little higher in any of the... And the other important thing here is it, this was all being turned by the John Deere's engine that was sitting out and belted to uh, the, the, one of these pulleys on the other side. If you want to, it, 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 we made up our own belts. <coughs> and what was interesting was if you wanted to turn it the other direction, you just put a twist on it as you put it over the pulley and we back up the John Deere and make sure that it was a tight enough belt to drive all this equipment and then block the tractor there. And of course, this piece of equipment was really block solid. So that's a story on the, on the uh, threshing machine in two minutes. <laughs> okay, now we're down at the port and uh, we're going to show something as it relates to the King family, but a little history of this uh, port area down here. Right about where we're standing here was a fish cannery. I'm, I'm sorry, not a fish cannery. It was a pea cannery. When they were peas were being grown out in the valley, uh, they, came, they were brought in here in the trucks to uh, can in the peas. Back before World War II, you've got to remember nearly everything was canned. We didn't have the big freezing operations that you see nowadays. So your groceries were going to be canned. Whatever. Fish. But anyway, uh, we, when we went off to other islands with the scow, we'd bring a scow load of lambs back here to take over to the slaughterhouse. When the scow landed, it would be right over there, right about over the top of that hill there, uh, there was a ramp, and we would drive the sheep off the scow, over to Spring Street, up to the Coldwell Banker building, the first street up, and across, and 
back over where the parking lot is for the ferry now, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, and into the slaughterhouse. And then the fuel dock was always here, and we had to see the temperatures and this of the insane boats. They were all parked alongside the dock here, like six feet. They also would be that many boats over in front of the cannery, which we'll talk about in a minute. Up where Friday Harbor House was, is now, was a, the Douglas home. And it's a single home that was up there. It burned down about 40 years ago. And then now it's a hotel. To the left of that, and behind the modern building that you see there now was the Ford garage and, uh, and then there were tanks for the fuel that was brought to the island on that hillside about where the modern building is up in the back. Where the new building is down here in the dock is where the McKenzie uh, grain uh, grinding operation and also the main ferries came in here, rather than over where the ferry dock is now. So, and then on just on the far side of that was a big warehouse building. And when the uh, boats came in to unload the groceries or whatever, we would pick, it, pick them up over there with the King's Market pickup truck. There was no street across where the place is now over to the ferry land. In order to get from this street to the slaughterhouse and over behind the cannery, you had to go up to the next street in town across to get back in. Uh, there was the Union Oil Dock here, 76, and further on over on the other side of that landing was the standard oil dock, and uh, the seniors would come in and fuel up at whichever they preferred. We had the ferry right in between the two docks. Now, over further, we have Canberra Village now, and you see the condominium there. All of that area near the waterfront was uh, Friday Harbor Packing Company, where the fish cannery was. So we have the fish cannery, and then behind it was a place that we called the Jap House, where the uh, workers that were brought in from the Oregon, and I think during my day it was mostly Filipinos who came over and worked in the canneries, uh, lived and ate in there. And right next door, on up towards the main street was the slaughterhouse, and that was really the main point of uh, Wild King's operation. And I believe that he got the slaughterhouse going first and then realized two things. One, he wanted to sell meat on the island, and two, he wanted to have a load to bring back from Seattle when you have this empty truck down there after they had done all the hours stop. Uh, I hope we can give you a picture of the Friday Harbor Packing Company. There is still one remnant of that, and that is the White House, the White House that we see over there above the place, restaurant, the rest, and right about that. That's where the owner of the uh, Friday Harbor Packing Company lived. And the so uh, that's about what we can show you from here. Uh, right straight up here where the Union Oil dock. Right up there now is the American Legion. It was not the American Legion when I was here. But to the right of it was the study club, which is where we 
held on with school dances and uh, the study club ladies on. And just behind this big crane were hiding the Whale Museum, which was the Odd Follows Hall until it was taken over. Right. Didn't they have a Coast Guard base station here yes, at one time? I, yes, I forgot to mention that, but there was a Coast Guard, I think it was like a 63 footer or something like that. It had about eight or nine crew, and they stayed at the Standard Oil dock, which is right out that, that red building behind the fuel pier here. It's the place restaurant right now, and right out from that, the Coast Guard tied up along this dock that was also the standard oil dock at the end. And, and the original lab building was down there? The original lab building was down about, oh, 2,000 feet from the camera. And that had already, and during my time, the uh, labs had already moved over to the far point over there where they're located today. And uh, the Moose Hall was right down here. We had Friday night dances. That was right across the street from the place restaurant. But that road did not go through. There was a big wet ditch valley that came down through there that they filled in to make that road and what it is today. What was Downriggers originally named? Do you remember? Uh, Downriggers went through uh, several different names. But it's been a downrigger for a long time, maybe 25 years now. Yeah. Uh, riptide? Or the riptide was uptown? No, the riptide was up in the middle of the town. I can't uh, really recall the, the different names that the various uh, restaurants went through. And uh, also, the Savages had the seaplanes. And they operated right out of here. Right? They had a little... Uh, kiosk type building and uh, you went down here to catch the, the seaplanes. And he flew to Bellingham was it or? I don't think they had a, a route. I think you uh, chartered them. Mm -hmm. So they, they were important around here in the uh, aircraft business. boat right down here <coughs> is, is a gill netter. I don't know if it fits as part of this or not. But this is about a 29 foot Robert. It has that big drum on the back. And the way the gill netter works is he throws over one of those buoys with a light on it. And in Washington State here, the net is 1,800 feet long. It's about 200 feet deep and it's a five inch mesh. What we hope when we're out gill netting is that the fish are going to come along and swim into that net and not be able to get on through and not be able to get back out. And then when we feel it's time to move somewhere else, that net is hydraulically lifted back onto the drum and the fish are picked out in the back area a catch of say 200 fish is very, very good night. So it's easy to just have those fish in a small fish hole or tote. So I did that for about 25 years. How long was the gill net industry running here when, the, when you could actually make money gill net? Well, the Biosage brothers came here in the 40s, early 40s, and were the first gill netters and the thing about that was in those days they were linen nets and these guys actually made the nets themselves yeah. and the darn uh, linen had to be soaked in uh, bluestone between uh, any time you're going to be not fishing for a couple of days so they had a big tank over this Friday Harbor packing where they When was about the last year that there was an active gill net? Well, Mid-70s or so? Gill netting went 
great. 73 was a great year. We sometimes get five nights in a row to, to fish. Uh, in 1974, the Bolt decision went through, and there was a lot of uh, fighting back and forth as to how that was going to be implemented. And so there were two or three more years of good fishing there. But then uh, the administration of the fishery and uh, other agreements, like the agreement the way we made to uh, satisfy the sports fishermen was the uh, rivers of origin. So we uh, joined with an agreement with Canada that if they would stay off of our fish, uh, we would stay off of theirs based on the bad thing about that was the Fraser River comes right up here against the west side of our island and it was a huge industry. The uh, fish that we got back, supposedly, was the Columbia River, which had nice runs originally, of course, with all the dams and so forth. They, they went down and uh, so we gave up a dollar to get a quarter. Uh, but people didn't realize that. Let's see, what else should we cover here? Oh, I think. When we were kids, we would swim from here over to Brown Island there. Uh, we were tough in those days. And Sam Buck was involved in developing ground. Sam Buck did, did, did get involved with it. It went to a couple of friends of mine, Dick Frank and Jack yeah. Powell, owned the property, and they offered it to the city for a park. But that was probably in the uh, late 70s, and uh, the city didn't want any more responsibilities. It was a pretty small town have uh, a feeling as to what the value of that property would finally turn out to be. How about the history of Jensen Shipyard? When uh, when did that start, first start? What was the reason? Well, the, the Jensen Shipyard was started by Nordine Jensen's dad, and they called it, I think, Jensen and Brother. His uh, Nordine's other brother was uh, went on to college and became Architect, marine architect. So Nordine ended up with this. And during the all of the fifties, they built. They were building wooden boats down there. And, uh, I owned one of his thirty-six foot gill netters. Wonderful, strong boats with a big old one-ton diesel in there that turned out 100 horsepower. Mm -hmm. Later on, with the truck engines and stuff, those 100 horsepower could be put at 800 pounds. But uh, my Steadfast had uh, had the old Cummins diesel, and uh, they were great boats, except they rolled like crazy. There was no uh, sharp angles to stop the boat from rolling. And I never took a person other than my son Mike with me who didn't get seasick on that boat. But that was a uh, temporary disease. <laughs> okay, well, let's. Uh... All right.